So this video is going to do a deep analysis on Enbridge. They're a large energy company. They are responsible for energy transmission all over North America in terms of oil, liquid natural gas, and they're also getting into renewables. So we're going to talk all about them, talk about the dividend, talk about the price, valuation, you name it, we're going to talk Enbridge. So the thing about Enbridge is that they are in the energy sector, but they don't pull oil and gas out of the ground. They're in the transmission business, so they move energy around in pipelines, both oil, natural gas, and different forms of renewable energy. They are making that shift into renewables to try to diversify their business, and they're slowly ramping up their interest in wind, solar, geothermal, and other types of renewable energy. So being in the energy transmission business, they actually negotiate long-term contracts with their customers, the folks that actually need to move oil from point A to point B. And so because of these long-term contracts, they're somewhat insulated from short-term swings in the price of oil and natural gas. And they further try to manage this volatility using uh, financial derivatives like options and futures contracts to try to stabilize the revenue over time. And they've gotten very, very good at that. When the price of oil experiences all this volatility, you typically don't see the same volatility in the underlying earnings and revenue that a company like Enbridge will see. That said, they're not immune to the overall trends of energy. The entire sector is in secular decline. It's not a growth sector. You know, it's, it's slowly, slowly dying, extremely slowly over time. Uh, but a company like Enbridge is still managing to extract value from that sector over the long term, and I think they'll continue to be able to do that. So they currently own 25% of all oil transmission in North America and 22% of all liquid natural gas. That's a big chunk of a big market. And as I mentioned, they're currently investing in a shift over to renewables. You know, if you go on the website and if you read about their future strategic direction and all kinds of things, it's all renewables. They're absolutely making a big effort to push the story on renewables. If you look at the numbers, it's not quite what they claim to be. Uh, they've spent $7.8 billion on renewables, but that's spread over the last 18 year period. So if you look at the massive size of the company and what they actually own uh, you know, across the board, the amount of investment in renewables is actually not all that impressive. Currently, they get 55% of their revenue from the pipeline business. They get about 40% from the natural gas business. And they only get about 4% of that revenue from renewable energy. What's the upside potential? So Enbridge has a wide moat, and you'll hear this term sometimes in stock analysis and finance, and it refers to the fact that there are enormous barriers to entry. If you were trying to start up a company to compete with Enbridge in the transmission business, it would be almost impossible. There is an enormous amount of regulatory resistance to actually building out new transmission pipelines, plus the environmental resistance to it, the legal challenges. Um, Enbridge is the owner of an, of an infrastructure that really can't be challenged, it can't be built, uh, or it can't be rebuilt, I should say, and it really can't be expanded upon to any great degree. Now that said, Enbridge is still slowly and painfully moving ahead with pipeline expansion projects. Their Line 3 and their Line 5 projects are moving ahead at tremendous cost and very, very slowly, but they are absolutely moving. Uh, Enbridge is actually able to continue to expand that wide moat, which is a huge advantage. So the other thing to consider is that outside of the current drop in demand due to the pandemic, there is a bottleneck in energy transmission. It's very difficult to build these new pipelines, like I said, but there is still tremendous demand for moving oil uh, around North America and to try to get it to these ports so that it can be actually shipped off the continent. Uh, the difficulty in moving it along these pipelines is huge and the pressure is so bad that a lot of times when it gets bad, uh, oil is being moved and natural gas is being moved by rail instead. So the ability to operate your infrastructure at peak capacity for a company like Enbridge is another fantastic advantage. In terms of investment, there is a very attractive yield that is going to support the current share price. The folks that are interested in investing in a company like Enbridge are looking for yield. They can absolutely find it there, and I think the share price is going to be supported by the attractiveness of that yield. As the price drops, the yield climbs, people buy, and the share price gets supported. And I think that's absolutely what we saw about a month ago when the share price was bottomed out around $38 or so. 
uh, it was snapped up by buyers that were looking for a yield north of 8% in a big stable company. And of course, talk about the yield, there was actually just the announcement of a dividend increase. It wasn't huge, it was a 3% increase, but still, to have an increase at a time like this, when revenues and sales are down, and a lot of people were talking about a cut, is pretty fantastic news, and it speaks to the underlying health of the business. And broadly speaking, I would say that the bull case here for Enbridge is very, very similar to Big Tobacco, 20 to 30 years ago. Yes, it's in secular decline. Yes, there's a ton of headwinds against the business. Yes, there's not a ton of growth out there and there's painful expenses in looking to pivot. But that said, there is a ton of value and a ton of revenue to be extracted from an industry in secular decline over the next couple of decades. Enbridge is not going anywhere soon and neither is oil or natural gas. We are going to be dependent on fossil fuels for quite some time and Enbridge is in a unique position to wring a ton of value uh, from that particular sector over the next little while. Let's talk about risk. Now, of course, this idea that, this, that the energy sector is in decline is absolutely going to play into the bear case for Enbridge long term. You have to wonder how long can this go on? How long can we continue to extract value from fossil fuels in a really cost effective and meaningful way? Um, you know, I think there's no doubt that we can continue to do that in the short term, but what is the long term outlook for an energy company like Enbridge? Are they going to be able to pivot quickly enough and at the right time into renewable energy? And really that's the very difficult position that Enbridge is in. They can't pivot immediately to renewables because it doesn't make sense, the technology isn't ready. Um, but they're going to have to delicately balance that slow decline of their current assets over time and the capital investment is going to take to ramp up renewables. So they have to get both of those things right and the third thing they have to get right is the time frame. How quickly are they going to uh, make that shift happen? It's a very, very difficult balancing act and it's hard to see anybody pulling that off with any degree of accuracy. The other thing to consider is the possible disruption to the current energy uh, regime within the world today. There could absolutely be a significant disruptor in terms of technology that would crop up that would lead to dramatic in, uh, increases in efficiency in some alternative energy form, whether it be wind, solar, geothermal, nuclear, whatever it is. All of those industries have a lot of R&D behind them, and if there was a breakthrough discovery in one of them that could disrupt the energy business to a significant degree, a company like Enbridge could feel the impact of that. So the fundamental analysis picture for Enbridge is all about the dividend. And if we take a look here at the current yield of 7.67%, that's a fantastic yield. Like I say, that's going to bring investors in. The growth story in years past on the dividend was pretty fantastic. Uh, we're looking at a five-year growth rate of 16%. And even over the last year, the dividend has grown by 10%. Now, I don't think that same growth is going to be the case go forward. Um, Enbridge is in a more difficult position in the years coming and growth forecasts for the next few years wouldn't support a 10% year-over-year increase in that dividend. Now, we can see here the payout ratio based on earnings is a whopping 347%. I think this confuses a lot of people. There are some companies that are very, very heavy in terms of infrastructure, um, capital-intensive businesses that can't solely be judged in terms of their payout ratio on earnings. Instead, you have to use a different metric called DCF or distributable cash flow. And if you actually use that metric to look at Enbridge's payout ratio, you get a number closer to about 69%, which is very, very conservative. It's quite reasonable. In fact, management is targeting a 65% payout ratio based on DCF. So we're only just a little bit above their target, which is not a bad place to be at all. That said, there's not a ton of room to grow, and this is why I don't see a ton of growth in the dividend go forward. They're on the upside of their targeted range for a DCF-based payout ratio, and they're only projecting a 5 to 7% increase in DCF in the next several years. So if that distributable cash flow is only growing at that rate, it's really hard to see how the dividend could grow at a significantly different rate. So I'm not really expecting much more than 5% growth in the dividend go forward. So let's take a look at a comparison here for Enbridge in terms of its peers. I've um, put a few up here. I've got Enbridge alongside TC Energy, Pembina, Interpipeline, and Kiera. So if you look at these, you can get a size or you can get a sense of the relative size of these companies. Uh, Enbridge and TRP are definitely the dominant players in terms of market cap, 
whereas these are all smaller companies. If you look here at the 10-year annual sales trends, they're all relatively similar. I think Enbridge has had a healthier growth in sales over the last decade, which really is responsible for that growth uh, year over year in the dividend. They've been able to fuel it by that increase in sales over the last decade. I don't think the next decade is going to look the same as the last one, though. You know, I think analysts are curiously uh, both bullish and bearish about Enbridge, and you can see that here in the price target. Um, you know, we've still got a significant amount of upside, even to the mean price target of 51.30 on this particular stock. So if we take a closer look here at some of the valuation metrics, again, you have to sort of ignore the PE and PEG ratios. They're not good valuations for companies in this industry. But price to sales is... And I think if you look at the current price to sales based valuation on Enbridge, it compares pretty favorably with all of these companies. It certainly looks to be a better value stock at the moment than TRP. Uh, and this is probably the company that most investors would compare it to in terms of looking at where they want to put their money. Sales growth go forward is not looking um, all that great for Enbridge. That we're only projecting here a 4.8% growth. I think this is in line with management's projections of that 5 to 7% number. Um, it's actually a relatively easy business to sort of make these forecasts for. So I think there's a, a pretty high degree of confidence in the growth numbers go forward. You know, interest coverage is a little bit of a problem for all of these companies. Enbridge is saddled with a ton of debt. Um, I think investors are a little bit anxious to see some debt service and they haven't seen it lately. I think Enbridge really needs to step up and start paying down that debt in the next couple of years as interest rates start to rise or if they start to rise. In the meantime, though, I think they're okay with the current debt load, but it's something to keep an eye on. So what's my thoughts overall on Enbridge? You know, I own Enbridge, but I own it for three reasons. I own it for the high dividend yield. I own it for the moderate dividend growth that I expect in the future. And I own it for diversification. So it's really hard to find a good stock in the energy sector right now especially one that looks stable, pays a good dividend, and has some growth prospects. Um, with so many of them at the whim of the price of oil, it's really, really hard to find stability in that industry. But I want to diversify into energy and at least get some exposure to it. So for me, as primarily a dividend growth-focused investor, it's a really good pick because it does give me that additional exposure into energy. I think if you're more interested in aggressive growth and capital appreciation in terms of the price, then I think I'd probably look elsewhere. So that's it, guys. I hope this analysis made Makes sense. If it does, please like the video. Consider subscribing if you haven't already. Ring the bell and I'll see you on the next one.